Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto, and I am coming to you on November 26, year 2023. It is 4 p.m. PDT. Welcome, longtime subscribers and supporters and patronistas, and welcome to those who uh, were lured in by the provocative title of today's talk toward post-woke, in quotation marks, America. All right. And today I'm going to be specifically dealing with um, one particular presidential candidate. Don't tune out because I know that there's still uh, a large, huge body of support for Orange Man, as we affectionately call him. By the way, if um, you're in the live stream and you can't hear the audio, let me know. I brought in my regular microphone, finally set it up. I have a camera. I need to get the lighting together, but uh, uh, see Deborah Johnson. You know, okay. Thank you very much for letting me know, because I can I can only tell from the monitor here what's going on, and uh, I look uh, more yellow than usual. But uh, I'll correct that later when I get the the lighting together. Um, I figured that the audio takes priority here, and I wasn't really satisfied with previous casts from my uh, new location. I didn't like the, um, this camera's not ideal either, but it's it's better than what's available on the uh, the Mac. So we're gonna we're gonna improve, we're gonna upgrade slowly but surely, thanks to your support. But getting back to the, today's topic, I've had ample time. Welcome also to the reason why I'm getting right close to the screen is because the print is really, really small. Uh, I have a monitor, an external monitor, but still small. But welcome, is it Nosher? DK, I can't read it. And uh, Deborah Johnson. Um, but it's a book by um, Vivek Ramaswamy, right? Woke Incorporated. And the subtitle is Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam. And it was published, uh, I think, in hardback 2022. The paperback edition, which I have here, 2023. Um, you're going to be seeing a rip roaring uh, series of clips today, which I prepared, and uh, you'll recognize some of the characters who appear in them. And again, uh, please indulge us and indulge me in specific, because um, I, I know there are strong opinions about certain personalities. That's good. That's really what the rough and tumble about politics are, are about. And uh, politics is um, serious business, yeah, but it's, um, as you know, um, it was put very clearly, it's also a performative, as the academic term would have it, exercise, right? And we have fun with it, uh, but it's dead serious, it, um, you know, literally dead, deadly serious when it comes down to it. It, it deals with matters of of the economy of society and culture, they're all bound together. And um, that's what attracted me to um, this book. Uh, it, it pretends to or aspires to. And I think I'll tell you in advance, I think he he ticks a lot of the, the marks that uh, I'm looking for in a political candidate, not necessarily just for president, but also school board or people on the um, state level, right? A, a, a person whose vocation, not their profession, but their vocation, their calling. This is from Max Weber. He wrote a series of essays. He's a early, old school political theoretician before there was something called quote unquote political science. And he had a very impressive essay called uh, Politics as a Vocation. And um, I encourage everybody, it's kind of hard going, I admit. I read it as an undergraduate. I was a political science major. <laughs> um, and it was assigned to us by uh, Professor Morris Mandelman, very influential uh, intellectual in, in my life. Um, and his lessons and insights carried through my own um, personal and professional life. So I thank him. And um, I see a lot of elements in this politics of, of aspiration, of, ho of, of hope, uh, because that's the big gap, as, as Max Weber talks about, is that 
there's the gap between the ideal that that is what we aspire to what we would like to see right the heavenly city whatever you want to talk about it heaven on earth the city upon the hill all the different images the tropes the themes that uh, have been handed down through the ages through um scripture through the popular culture definitely and from our own i think sense of um longing as human beings living under the same sun and the same moon right people uh, the world over and there's this gap between the ideal and the real the is and the ought the gap between the is and the ought and it's always going to be there all right that gap is you know you can call it original sin however you want to express it but we're not going to have paradise on earth and we're not going to have a utopia and these fake solutions have been sold to us over and over again by different dictators would be leadership and whatnot and it's it's typically not i don't know if i'm going to say globally but um almost always is has ended in disaster right so that's um after with weber max weber as i'm talking about that's the approach i'm taking right so if you're if you're a a, a stone cold uh, orange man loyalist in full disclosure i voted for him not once but twice the first the real election the second the stolen one <laughs> i voted voted twice i supported him and he's a flawed individual he's a radically flawed individual and again if you've heard listen to my preface about the gap between the is and the ought and the real and the ideal in utopia versus you know day-to-day -day existence <laughs> then you'll have an idea why i will let him slide in certain certain areas certain up to a certain point him or anybody else right for example samuel bank and freed i've been watching the case until its recent conclusion he hasn't been sentenced yet it's not that's not going to happen until march of next year uh but i've watched been watching a lot of um particularly uh, yellow women female journalists who are really coming to the the fore here as analytical presences and uh, looking and observing the, the changeover from what i call the rothschild banking system which ramaswamy does not address by the way um he's still very much in the uh the thrall if not the grip of the rothschild bankers um but if you if you've been listening to my shows and i welcome you and invite you and encourage you to look at my playlist you will know that uh, i think that the, that the real challenge to the rothschild banking system that is the uh, centralized fake federal reserve the private because you, you you know this already it's privately held right by bankers banks banking families bloodlines registered bloodlines um and also the, uh, the the bailout economy that we have so-called too big to fail that was the phrase that was that was bandied about it uh, i think beginning the, the 2008 financial and these crises are recurrent not because they're part of some sort of uh, galactic system of some immutable forces of nature it's because as most of you know and i'm sorry if i'm uh, insulting your intelligence because most of you are at a higher level that's why i only have twelve thousand subscribers most people want to watch joe bonehead you know smoke pot with elon musk or you know these retooled retread comedians right especially young men who don't have enough testosterone to really get over in life they, they'd like to watch uh, uh who's the other retread comedian crowder yeah those those types of people uh, but I'm dealing with a different audience, and that's fine. I have a boutique audience. <laughs> I prefer to call you more discerning. Uh, I would like to have younger people because I think my message is largely directed towards the future and, and hope, drawing from the past. Speaking of which, by the way, if politics bores the hell out of you, I'll be leading that topic periodically because um, I'm a Beatles fan, and I recently... You know where have i been discovered this author his name's kenneth olmack and surprise surprise he has an academic job and he writes about the beatles uh, that's my ideal job right there um 
Uh, this, uh, so I'm reading his, both of his major books. This is called Solid State. This is just an advertisement for coming, coming attractions because I don't just talk about politics. If you're a newbie here, I don't just talk about politics and crypto and uh, all the personalities. That's just sort of a sort of a phase that I'm going through right now, especially since we're running up to the election. It's hitting the news and there's all kinds of exciting developments, positive ones too, because this is not, uh, you know, like your little uh, device that you have, doom swiping, they call it. Like you read all the bad headline stuff. There's a lot of good stuff coming on it. And I don't think Tube you really reflects that. And um, uh, I'm hearkening back to the past uh, with figures such as the Beatles. You don't think they're important politically? Well, I'll tell you why. I'll share, you, share with you my opinions as well as that of authors who are generationally now coming to the fore. So that's coming up. And then a, a new book. This is the one I bought first by the same author, uh, Kenneth Womack. It's called Living the Beatles Legend. And this is about a what might be what I considered him to be a peripheral character. I know he was important because I've seen the documentary, the recent one, right? Uh, that was, I guess, on the Disney Plus channel. Something. I, I'd like to see it on DVD. I'd like to have the set so I can watch it over and over. I have, you know, I'm I'm a Beatles nut, and I thought I knew a lot about the Beatles. I don't make any claims anymore because there's a whole generation now, second generation of people who know everything. They can run circles around me. Uh, I do. I can play uh, maybe about 25% because they wrote over 200 songs. I can play about, I say, 10%, maybe even 25% of the Beatles catalog by memory, by heart. I can play them. Uh, that's how steeped I, in into their music I am. But I'm also interested in them as a historical and sociological, anthropological, if you will, phenomenon. And this is about their... He's more than a roadie. I'll just leave it at that. I haven't finished reading the book. It's fascinating. So anyway, that's for people who um, are getting a little bit impatient with hearing about Tiff Fong or Tiffany Fong. I think it's a mistake for you to, have not to, to watch uh, the talk I gave. I think it was two weeks ago because it's about the USC connection, University of Southern California. All right. I'm trying to break us out of the skull and bones Sexy Nazi Yale, you know, the, the same old, same old formulaic conspiratorial conspiratainment dreck. That's a Yiddish word. Look it up in uh, Leo Rostin's book, The Joy of Yiddish. Right. And we're, we're talking about the uh, Sicilian mafia and the Jewish mafia and a little bit about the tongs and triads, but you're missing, you know, finance, right? <laughs> You're missing the, those guys from India and China who right now are like picking the world's pocket. And, uh, you know, I'm interested in the history and I find it fascinating to learn all I can about Mo Annenberg and how he created this um, empire of publishing and laundered his reputation and uh, created at least two major research institutions at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Southern California to dictate how uh, communications, including new media, uh, operate, how it functions, how it how it has become a handmaiden to power. Right. Previously, and I know it's just not true. Uh, down to the fine points that it was seen as the fifth estate. It was uh, the journalists were the conscience of, of the political class and uh, corporations, but most of us know that's no longer true. They've have fused. Well, Annenberg schools of communication at USC and at University of Pennsylvania and other places, but not just Annenberg, but places like Syracuse, um, uh, have control have come to control media and and journalism and ironically it's it's tube you like you're seeing right now it has created um, a space or we have taken the opportunity please people like myself have used this as an opportunity to go straight to the people getting out of the classroom because i had a career a long career a very successful career uh, at the university of california davis and i recently posted on the uh anniversary of the of the bear gassing by the previous uh, miscreant 
chancellor there who hung on as long as she could before she was forced out. Um, but I can take these these ideas to you directly. And um, there's a whole generational shift, perceptual and um, I, I guess media shift that uh, legacy media is now beginning to catch on to. And this, and this particular individual, Ramaswamy, is under 40. I think he's 38. He might be 39. Correct me if I'm wrong. All the nitpickers are waiting me to err, you know. Why don't you say, okay, he's 39, his, his uh, birthday is blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm trying to present a larger picture here. So anyway, he's under 40. How's that? He grew up with this, and he grew up in the the boom milieu of, of Wall Street. In fact, I think he honestly addresses the fact that even as a child growing up, you know, as, as a, as a um, Midwestern boy, he was born in America, by the way, because I have people telling me these are my own Patreons, Patreonistas, and um, you know they're they're not really happy. I'm not supporting Ramaswamy necessarily, by the way. This is not by any means a sort of a shill operation. I never met him. I only know him through his work, and I only know him like you through a lot of um, the presidential debate, uh, the Republican Party primary <laughs> debates. I think he's the front runner so far as that's concerned, but I'll show you a clip in a moment. And um, but like I told you, full disclosure, I did vote for uh, Donald J. Trump, not once, but twice. And uh, felt, I'll tell you up front, that the election was stolen from him. I don't know the particulars. And uh, I don't know the, the um, you know, I follow it slightly, Mike Lindell and... Sidney Powell, you know, people, you know, I read the books and I've gone and I've like you, I've lived through the controversies through it. And um, yeah, I was hoping that uh, he'll he'll um, manage to over. I'm talking about President Trump, overcome his current legal problems and, and ride back on the white horse. But we can't depend on that. And that's a message that I think he needs to get through, come off his ego throne and say, listen, if, if if it's not going to happen for, for me, Donald Trump, then, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy is someone you, you need to look at. And the same goes true for uh, Ramaswamy is that he says that if Donald Trump is the, the, um, the nominee from the Republican candidate, then he will support him 100%. Right. We'll see this in a clip that I drew. It's kind of a long one. If you'll bear with me, I don't know if we're going to have time to see it all with uh, the one and only Alex Jones. And again, I told you, <laughs> this this particular talk might turn you off. Number one, I'm talking about Ramaswamy as an alternative or as an, not an alternative, but as an addition to a compliment to Donald Trump. And there's a lot of people there who are so diehard. You're, you're like the homers, you know, not Homer Simpson, but the people who who followed some baseball or football team. You know, I know the psychology of it. I was a Stone Cold Lakers fan throughout the 1980s, you know, before the NBA really got hyped up with King James LeBron. I don't even, you know, he's on the Lakers now. Good, good. I don't even watch the Lakers. I didn't, um, for me, nothing rivals. Uh, and I grew up in Los Angeles. So I was a Dodger fan, you know, Walter Alston that year, Sandy Koufax. <laughs> oh, man, Sandy Koufax. Perfect game. So I understand that. But that's the psychology that rules. And Max Weber talks about this, if, even at the early stage before politics became a media-driven avocation for many people. He understood the mass psychology of it. Because leadership has certain, and, and this, the, 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 mass, uh, the masses have a certain psychology that were, they were already manifesting themselves in, in his days before the rise of people like Mussolini or Hitler, you know, or, or Stalin or Mao Zedong, right? And I'm not saying that Trump falls in that category, far from it. I'm just telling you, we, myself included, need to really evaluate our fanaticism. Right, that's where the term fan comes from. It's an abbreviation of fanatic. Right, 
and we need to get our heads screwed on straight so that we can um, avoid being whipsawed and manipulated by the usual forces that were put in place by the old gangster Mo Annenberg. Right? I'm not saying he's a gangster. The federal government said they threw him in prison. Right, and his son Jay Walter Walter J. Annenberg wound up at the this ambassador of the court of St. James's. That's the most uh, prestigious uh, ambassadorial post in the U.S. Foreign Service. And I gave a talk on that. Watch that. Right, forget about not forget about, but but leave behind the sexy Nazis and the skull and bone throw on, and stop talking about the John Kerry and uh, George Bush debate where they turn out to be. Both were skull and bones people. I've seen that. Millions of people have seen that. But that was yesterday. Right? I want to deal with today's issues because that's really what's uh, going to determine, you know, try to say it sounds it's going to determine our fate. Right? It's, it doesn't really matter now if John Kerry was skull and bones. And, you know, that's the books have been closed on that. But Tube You and all these conspiratorian the people just keep recycling this dreck all right it's time to move on get off your butt and i'm that's just this is an admonition admonition for myself and do the reading do the background instead of just sticking with your fanboy consciousness all right and that's what i intend to do today all right it's kind of a long-winded prelude um He's a legitimate candidate, from what I can tell. Um, he's not doing it for uh, immediate uh, gain in order to get a membership on a corporate board or to, to get fun. I mean, it might result in that, but I don't think that's his prime purpose. Or to enhance his um, business profile for future investors. He's been there and he's done that. He's uh, by his own description you can check this you can bid out this information on your own he's founded uh, any number of um companies large-scale companies himself you know that have had uh, ipos including probably most notably roy vont which i didn't know about until reading the book and roi vont this is a pharmaceutical company roi stands for return on investment so you can tell what he's doing here. He wants to do an R and he's he's got all the academic credentials. I think he went to private school. I think he went to Jesuit school, by the way, even though he's Hindu, right? And the Jesuits are really good at recruiting from from discrepant groups. By discrepant, I mean people who are not typically included amongst the country club set that used to and still do really to a large extent that run the banking system. Right. And they recruit people like Ramaswamy in, into places like Yale Law School. I think he did his undergraduate at Harvard. So your eggheads and the people who come from that bloodline or come from the Ivy League are going to like him uh, because he's one of them. Right. He's got that check marked. Right? By the way, Donald Trump is no, no dummy. He went to Wharton School of Business and he likes to tell us that he graduated at the high end of his class right just because he was and it's again these clips are run over and over again just because he did some stunts with the world uh, wrestling league or whatever it is or was on reality television <laughs> um you gotta love the guy for kind of rewriting the, the the playbook on what it means to be a presidential candidate in the early 21st century right we got a kind of a taste of it with slick willie clinton when he bopped onto the stage of the Arsenio Hall show, wearing shades and playing the tenor saxophone, right? We said, oh yeah, he's cool. He's our generation's uh, president. Look look what happened now, woo, wow. Eight years of hell that we're still trying to, you know, we still got burned from that one. And um, thank goodness uh, his uh, heir apparent, you know who I'm talking about, didn't make it to the oral office uh, that he occupied for eight years uh, under her auspices and those of his handlers, right? And who was the person who was the, uh, to mix metaphors, the dragon slayer it was none other than Orange Man, St. Saint, Saint, um, Saint Donald, right? 
Uh, so I can understand why we have this affection for him, and I, I still do, and I wish him the best of luck. And uh, I think he's going to, uh, they're going to, the public and the judicial system is going to lose interest in hassling him and harassing him. Because you know why? There's a new sheriff in town. His name is Vivek Ramaswamy. So it's really interesting, right? The forces of oppression and of censorship and of quote unquote wokeness. And by the way, I was the person who introduced the term woke to the mass media when I was being interviewed by the great John B. Wells. I encourage you to check out Caravan to Midnight uh, five days a week. It's a very interesting guest. I'm not just myself. I mean, I'm not. It's not about me. It's about I was on the show. I thought about woke before uh, before the world even heard about uh, the um, the Weinstein brothers, Harvey and uh, not Harvey, but Eric and Brent or whatever. Um, there's all kinds of journalists that that are beginning to look at them. One of them is Kirby Summers, who's done really extended look and where where they're coming from, right? So that's coming. Uh, that's being exposed now, and. Um, they're really not just them specifically, but that whole complex uh, has lost confidence and they'll try almost anything at this point in order to retain power, right? This is why I've been dealing with FTX and cybercrime and big pharma like Purdue Pharma, which I gave a talk on, by the way. None of them, none of those guys in big pharma, the family, the Sackler family, they're nothing but, you know, steaming sacklers of you know what. And they blame the Chinese, the Chacoms. Yeah, they are making uh, fentanyl. But the people who were dispensing it legally were the steaming sackler family who donated all this money to the pharmaceutical research complex at the university. Now they're getting their names chipped off the buildings that they donated to university of x y and z all right so things are changing for the better and it's because the people are doing their own um, research and journalism and there are a lot of people outside the annenberg orbit or the syracuse school of journalism whatever it is right they're all compromised and they all kind of not even tiptoe around they ignore the independent journalism that's why you need to subscribe to this right now this channel you need to forward this channel. You need to support me on Patreon. All right. For $5 a month, as little as, you get all kinds of extra material, supplementary material that I would not dare present to you on Tube You. Uh, every single one of them, these, these shows are watched very carefully. They don't censor me. They just don't monetize my work. I said, oh, there's some kind of background music that we heard. And so we're not going to give you a copyright strike but you don't get a penny out of it. That's, that's fine. That's, that's okay. Um, that's, you know, not why I do it. I'm not Joe Rogaine or any, you know, these other retreaded comedians, right? I was the class clown in junior high school, but I didn't go on to become a professional comedian unless you believe that um, most um, academics are ass clowns, which having gone through that profession, I might agree with you. <laughs> Uh, it's mostly, I think about today, mostly a bunch of mediocrities who sit around and evaluate other mediocrities, right? And I'm talking about mediocrities at, at the so-called good schools, right? Like Yale, Harvard, or whatever. You ask anybody who's gone to the the elite institutions, and it's really not a big deal for them. They just, you know, they understand, they know it's mostly a matter of access and hookups, right? And I'm not saying that... Um, uh, it doesn't matter. It does matter. You know, as a friend of mine told me the other day, uh, she said, you have to uh, be part of the part of the system in order to uh, change it uh, from the inside. You know, I don't know if I ever fully subscribe to that, <laughs> but I do know that standing on the outside and say, oh, everything's racist, everything's sexist, everything's anti, it's homophobic. I know that that doesn't work. In fact, it backfired. You know, originally all these organizations and, and political movements that were formed around substantive issues like race, you know, discrimination, 
sexual violence, uh, gender uh, discrimination, you know, those are real. But then the corporations figured out, hey, this is a, a wedge that we could use against the people who want to attack us and destroy us. So Woke Incorporated is capitalism trying to save itself from itself. <laughs> that's the irony of it. And that's just something that Ramaswamy uh, does not quite get because he is part of the system. Again, that doesn't mean that, you know, he, he can't be effective in that circumstance. I think he'd be highly effective. Number one, as I've already alluded to, they're not going to be able to ding him on his educational credentials. They're not going to say, well, you don't understand businesses, you know, big business, how it's run. And we've got quarterly goals to meet. And it's a complex uh, set of uh, regulations that we have by by, you know, he, he was a corporate CEO and he's bought and sold. He was also a, um, uh, a banker, an investment banker, a speculator, I guess, if you, if you want to cast dispersions on him, but he knows it from the inside. I think he was putting deals together with multi-million dollar companies when, while he was attending law school, you know, at Yale, right? So, uh, but I would like to address, since I'm already behind schedule here, a couple of other factors that I think are working against him, but are also working for him at the same time. Again, we have, as a society, America, we have made enormous progress in the area of race, religion, and ethnicity, and gender, right? I'm not saying that it's perfect. I'm not saying that it'll ever be perfect. Remember I cited Max Weber at the early stage of this talk between the gap between the is and the ought, but we, as Americans, we aspire to it. That is, we're, we're looking for that ideal state, and we get frustrated if we don't get it fast enough or to the degree that we hope that it, uh, you know, we, we envision it to be, right? We would like to have absolute equality. That might only happen once we're in heaven. I don't, really don't know. I'm not there yet, or hell, wherever, wherever I wind up. Um, so this is the tension that's inherent in any healthy society. Healthy societies have these discussions constantly. Strong societies are made more robust by this continual dialogue, and it can become highly contentious, acrimonious, and ad hominem even. But uh, that is the strength of the body politic. Right. That's what I think is one of the, I agree with Ramaswamy here is that that's one of the defining characteristics of American political culture. Right. But on the other hand, we cannot let it uh, assume that it's going to sort itself out without our intervention. We, the people. Right. And it's going to, it's beyond the great man on the white horse or the great woman on the white horse. It's not about personalities. It's not about Ramaswamy. It's not about Trump or Biden or anybody else. It's about you. It's about me. All right. Okay. So let's, let me just give you some of the, you know, if I put myself as a, as an advisor and I don't, I'm not lobbying for the job, by the way, uh, if he does become president though, I will consider being appointed uh, as the, uh, a cabinet member in education. I would like to be the the Secretary of Education of the United States of America because um, I would go in there and, and find rational ways to find all the fine people who are there currently, find them jobs at other federal or municipal or private agencies. I would encourage them to start up their own private company. But I would, uh, in other words, uh, go about dismantling the Department of Education so that by the time uh, President Ramaswamy's term is over, his first term is over in four years, there will be no Department of Education. And it'll be, education will be where it belonged originally. And that's with the, with the communities, right? Because it's, uh, America is a diverse society, rural and, and, uh, and urban, right? It's, 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 it's much more diverse than, than it's being made out to be or, or is characterized. 
So anyway, that that's an argument that you know we can talk about earlier uh, later, and um, that's one of his um, uh, selling points for his candidacy is to to attack education. Of course, all candidates do that. It's cheap. It's free. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be here to improve education. Well, we're going to have to uh, hold all these people accountable. Well, what's happened? You know, what what are the what are the measures of improvement there? So anyway, let me talk about um, the most significant, I think, uh, impediment to his um, his candidacy. And I thought we had possibly we had um, overcome this, right? Because we know uh, from studies by I don't know. Most of the major polling organizations come up with a consistent demographic pro uh, profile of so-called Asian Americans. And uh, within that large demographic profile, South Asians are at the top, man. And Ramaswamy is a representative of that class, the post-1965 immigrant entrepreneurial class that were allowed in after this historic barrier that was imposed in 1924 against people from Asia, there was a quote that says, from coming to the United States, which wasn't lifted till 1965. His parents are immigrants who came in the 70s. They were part of that early wave. And apparently his father, and they were of, a, of the Hindu caste, C-A-S-T-E. He talks about that because this book is all about his candidacy and like any good salesperson, he's anticipating objections on the part of the possible voter, right? So people are going to say, well, wait a minute. This is a society built upon principles laid out by Ibrahim or Abraham, right? So if you're a Jew or a, a Christian or a Muslim, you are of the Abrahamic faith. So that's okay. But Hindu? Come on. So he has to address that fact, right? Now, that's that doesn't preclude the fact that uh, uh, people of of non-Judaic or Christian or even Islamic faith, you know, like we we the people of the United States were ruled for eight years by Barack Hussein Obama, who was not Christian, and uh, there's the vice president currently, Kamala Harris, who's not Christian. So we seem to be okay with it. Right, we've overcome that. But Hindu, it's still kind of um, iffy. However, um, we were never engaged. The United States has never engaged uh, in world war in wars against India or South Asia, right, uh, or Hindu people. But they have been in war with East Asian people. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why I think among the Asian American groups, there's far more representation of South Asians or Indians, Sri Lankans, brown people, as opposed to the yellow people, because America still has a very strong racial memory of fighting the Chinese, fighting the Koreans, fighting the Japanese, right, in different world wars or undeclared, quote unquote, police actions. But we haven't had that national experience against brown people in India. If anything, it's just the opposite, right? We have these epic films from Hollywood, beginning with Gunga Dean, starring Sam Jaffe. Remember him? Dr. Zorba and Dr. Yeah, he was the star of it. He was the martyr. He was the brown martyr for British Anglo-American colonialism, right? He will serve. He will die for Sahib. So he's got that going for himself, right? Well, that's a pro category. But Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy uh, probably doesn't, maybe he does, but is not uh, acknowledging it. So I'm doing the acknowledgement here. If I was his campaign advisor, I'd say, Mr. Ramaswamy, you have to address the APU factor, right? That's A-P-U, the APU factor. What do I mean by the APU factor? Right. Any of you know the animated series called The Simpsons? By the way, I don't think they're Asian Americans, even though they are yellow. <laughs> I think that was just a, 
I don't know, maybe, maybe they are Asian because they're yellow, but there's a character in The Simpsons, I think it was as early as the first season, named uh, Apu. He was a South Asian stereotype. Um, and by the way, there was a uh, fairly new documentary, which I want to see. It's called The Problem with uh, Apu. And it's written by and it stars a uh, South Asian comedian. And there's a lot of them coming to the fore, by the way. His name's Zahari Kandubalu. And he was one of the people that say, hey, this is really a negative stereotype. By the way, this is my area. I wrote a book called Monitored Peril about Asian Americans and the politics of TV. And uh, you can read, it's still in print, University of Minnesota Press. And I encourage uh, Mr. Ramaswamy's people to take a look at that uh, because it's going to be useful in uh, your campaign, sir. Uh, because you do need to reach out to the Asian American professionals who are an untapped source of funding <laughs> and of political power, and they're waiting to be tapped, and they're not going to go for the usual sources to be touched upon. They that that the, your Mo Annenbergs have all that wrapped up. The Sacklers they have that all wrapped up. They're looking for a a new pony to ride. Okay, so check that out, and I've. You know, I've taught courses in this. I've taught Asian Americans in media at the University of California Davis for, you know, over 20 years. And it was so influential, so powerful, and so well attended that the uh, administration had to, had to uh, put people in place to make sure that I did not overshadow the people who were put in place to make sure that I didn't have any inroads on the real Asian American uh, studies not the fake one where we were going to become subjects and wards of the centralized therapeutic state under the rubric of Asian American so-called mental health. <laughs> so it was a battle, right? We're our own uh, worst enemy. Uh, this is what uh, I find time and time again. But anyway, let me just tell you a really quick anecdote about the Simpsons, the per personal one, and that's I taught this course for many, many years. And I did have a student who was South Asian. And I, every one of my classes, I, I, I have a research paper assignment. It's not one of those deals where you get to look at the notes, you buy them, or you don't show up to lecture. You got to be there in order to really absorb the lessons, just like this YouTube session, the lessons that I'm putting forth. It's not going to be in the cliff notes or a professional note taker. It's impossible. Um, my style does not lend itself to it. If you're in biology or math, perhaps, you know, that's going to work. But anyway, I did have a student who was South Asian, and she wanted a research paper. I said, great. Um, this is the type of creativity and intellectual curiosity that I want to support, right? This is not canned information. This is not the Happy Meal version of of academic uh, excellence you have to go up and and you have to generate your own projects just like in life you have to generate your own livelihood your own projects you have to create your own companies you have to manage them so that's what i'm trying to inculcate so i said well what do you have what what topic you want to do she says i don't know so well i'm not going to tell you I said part of the gig is to figure out you know the premise that you're going to explore the concept so she came back later and said, well, you know, I'm South Asian and I watched The Simpsons. <laughs> the Simpsons were huge when they first came out. And they, you know, remain so consistently. The writing is good. By the way, a lot of the, the, those um, writers of The Simpsons had advanced degrees from MIT <laughs> and all these techie schools. And there's a lot of these inside jokes in The Simpsons. That's why the intelligentsia of uh, Silicon Valley tends to like The Simpsons. That's why little children can like it because it's cartoony, right? Anyway, there's a whole uh, Simpsons lesson there that we could talk about at some other point. But getting back to the story here, the woman said, okay, I'm, one, I'm South Asian. And I really don't like the way Apu is, uh, this is the Apu factor we're talking about, is being portrayed by, uh, by the writers of The Simpsons. So I said, and this is before the internet. I mean, the civilian internet. This is before so-called social media. That's how 
how far back I go. I said, well, why don't you write uh, the creator? I know who he is. His name's Matt Groening, G-R-O-E-N-I-N-G. And I said, because I used to read his little underground comics panels in the Los Angeles uh, Village Voice or something. I can't, you know, one, one of those free papers that you you pick up outside of the cafe and you go in there and read about the entertainment or uh this is again before the internet and this is how you found out what was playing at the local theater or who was coming to town in music so grainy had a little comic strip it was called um well one was called akbar and the other one was called the Simpsons. it started out as a cartoon or a um a panel cartoon panel then it became animated and he was a you know the an, anim not to, you know use the pun here but the animating force behind the simpsons originally so she took my advice and she wrote matt graining and guess what he wrote her back this is direct citizen democracy he wrote her back and say hey, listen i'm a jew so we know what stereotypes all about i mean i don't buy that argument uh, if anything you should be more sympathetic i would think to people who are being maligned and and your your whole you know contributions are being expropriated or stolen like kung fu you know that was bruce lee's idea it was not this guy who who you know bruce lee was supposed to be chai uh is it chai quang cane or something you know the cane not david carradine they were going to use the one and only little you know the dragon but you know he was a he was a chinaman and they didn't want to do that so they put you know there's a whole story that read my book called monitored peril and read my book uh nervous laughter it talks about the politics of race quite extensively so anyway she got the letter back from Matt granny was really it was good it was all hand lettered by the way like cartoon lettering you know like you see in the professional comic books and uh, he drew a cartoon of apu you know he drew it and he gave it to him. he signed it and gave it and that was like a prize possession um now that didn't um get him off the air i don't think she was calling for censorship if a few you know 10 years later she would you know came to undergraduate at uc davis she would be part of the woke group who were cynically exploited by the counseling psychologists under mental health right to attack people like me right they use them for the GLBTQ, Black Lives Matter, and all that, they they put them started putting them in my classes, infiltrators. And you know how I got rid of them? I said, okay, you give the next lecture. Here's the microphone, jackass. And they all they they didn't show up the next lecture because they know they were they were frauds, and they it was something that was they were put up to by the psychology the psychotherapist that had taken over the university and they're still there by the way and this is something that uh, mr ramaswamy has to address it's the part of the incorporated part is the, the so-called mental health and the big pharma complex which have decimated the university right the glbtq blt you know, that is only epiphenomenal that is a manifestation of a larger hijacking of of a uh, big pharma, uh, including gender uh, cancellation, cancel culture, uh, that has uh, been brought into the university by people like you know the big pharma hijackers, right? So he has to deal with that since he does come from big pharma. And I'm not really convinced that his uh, solutions are are all that great. But getting back and finishing up with the Apu factor. You know, I am now, since I had announced ahead of time that I was going to do something on Vivek Ramaswamy, people who pro obviously have not read the book, right? I'm not blaming you. Uh, this, you know, it's fairly new and many people are still stuck on Joe Rogan, right? Who would otherwise, and he's been on the show, I think, Joe Rogan. He's been on the Alex Jones show, as I'll show you. And he's got a lot of attention by some of the people who are, you know, especially young men who are of that generation who have had their testosterone systematically drained from their um, their systems. And um, he's the dark horse 
uh, no pun intended, in, in this race here. And, and we can thank Donald Trump and his detractors and his enemies for taking all the flack and allowing a somewhat open lane for Ramaswamy to operate in. And I think they're now catching on to that, and they're going to try to find a way to neutralize him. Right, he's running as a Republican, a Republican candidate. In fact, let's take a look at his, because um, I promised you some videos here. Let's take a look at his uh, opening pitch for um, President of the United States. And he's born in America, okay? So speaking of the Apu factor, unlike Barack Hussein Obama, who we never really definitively determined where he was born in, in order to be qualified as the United, uh, president of the United States, you have to be native born in America, the United States of America, right? And Vivek Ramaswamy was born in um, the state of Ohio. We can get his birth certificate, I'm sure we'll have to. That'll be one of the requirements, I think, before anybody truly will support him or should support him. Anyway, let's take a look at his campaign pitch. I'm a successful entrepreneur, and I'm running for president of the United States. We're in the middle of a national identity crisis. Faith, patriotism, and hard work have disappeared. Wokeness, gender ideology, and the climate cult have taken their place. We spend so much time celebrating our diversity that we forget the values that bind us together. And I believe deep in my bones those values still exist. I'm Vivek Ramaswamy, and I approve this message because we can take our country back. Short and sweet, okay? If you haven't seen him, I don't know where you've been if you haven't. Uh, that gives you a first 30-second uh, spot glimpse of Vivek Ramaswamy. I encourage you to read his book. I think he has another one out, too. Um, let me make some uh, further observations. He is demographically, right? I think we've covered the Apu factor. And uh, I don't think it's going to be a deal-breaker for Mr. Ramaswamy. You can have uh, the Democratic hack, Donna Brazier, mis intentionally mispronounce his name, Ramadama Nubu Duba Duba Ding Ding Dang. Right? She's a black woman, but she's she's got over now. So I guess she's, you know, she can, uh, she's got license and she's an oppressed minority to like dump on uh, the Asian people, right? who uh, black soldiers, by the way, have been recruited in droves in order to kill, right, over in, in Japan and Korea and Okinawa and uh, and Vietnam. So that's Donna Brazier. Yeah. And by, by the way, uh, Bill Maher um, called her on it. You know, Mr. Mr. Um, politically correct Bill Maher, uh, another retreaded comedian who we're supposed to take seriously. By the way, I went, you know, I used to live down there so I could go to this show. I went to the early Bill Maher show when he had this, before he went PC, right? And um, he's, he's, he's a good, he's a major talent, but there's a reason why people like Gre uh, Greg Gutfeld and all the retread comedians have these jobs as, or, um, across the ocean, right? Um, what's his name? Mr. Lindsay Lohan, right? He got written up in the, uh, yeah, I have it right here. I was reading it in breakfast the other day. Yeah, he was written up in the New York Times Magazine. And he's a Brit, but half of his audience is America, is in America, uh, United States of America. He's another retread comedian, Russell Brand. See, I tried to lock his name out. He's another uh, funny man who we're looking to for political wisdom, right? What's up with that? That could be a whole book. Funny men retread <laughs> who are political uh, commentators. You know, I know we Americans like everything to be gamified and um, in entertainment but this is ridiculous it doesn't have to be boring like george will or the sunday news <laughs> and commentary pro it doesn't have to be like um like pbs but give me a break i, I can't take anything that's coming out of uh, greg gutfield's mouth seriously of course i can't take the, the moderators let's take a look at the at the um the some of the clips here from uh, the 
recent Republican candidate speech of uh, Ramaswamy takes them to task, right, about how they are making this into a giant farce. I'm talking about mainstream or legacy media. Let's take a look at this. It's really good. And uh, I thank you, uh, the courtesy of of the people who originally produced this. If you want to um, claim it as a monetization, that's fine. You know, go ahead. I want to get the information out about uh, our political culture, and I'm using your material, which you went to the um, great effort to put together, and I, I acknowledge that. I don't mean to be trying to make money off of you. So here, here we go. The Trump-Russia collusion hoax that you pushed on this network for years, was that real or was that Hillary Clinton made up disinformation? Answer the question, go. I say this as a member of my generation. I'm 38 years old. I'm the youngest person ever to run for US president as a Republican. The reason my generation has lost our sense of national pride in part is because people in my generation feel like the American dream isn't available to them. And part of the reason why is we burdened them with four-year college degrees that did not serve their head start on the American dream. People will be more proud of a country if we're all making more money in that country. This is how we revive national pride and our identity, and it will take a CEO in the White House with zero-based budgeting, by the way, to take on Mr. the federal Ramaswamy, debt to get you. this job done. It. I want to be careful to avoid making the mistakes from the neocon establishment of the past. Corrupt politicians in both parties spent trillions, killed millions, made billions for themselves in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, fighting wars that sent thousands of our sons and daughters, people my age, to die in wars that did not advance anyone's interests, adding $7 trillion to our national debt. And Joe Biden sold off our foreign policy. Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, got a $5 million bribe from Ukraine. That's why we're sending $200 billion back to that same country. The fact of the matter is the Republican Party is not that much better. You have the likes of Nikki Haley, who stepped down from her time at the UN. Bankrupt or in debt is, was her family. Then she becomes a military contractor. She joins the board of Boeing and otherwise, and is now a multimillionaire. So I think that that's wrong when Republicans do it or Democrats do it. That's the choice we face. Do you want a leader from a different generation who's gonna put this country first? Or do you want Dick Cheney in three-inch heels? All right, Mr. In which case, we've got two of them on stage tonight. Eight years old, and the youngest person ever to run a dream isn't available to them. And That's some pretty powerful rhetoric. I don't know who his writers are, but they're pretty uh, clever with the one-liners. Uh, Dick Cheney in three-inch heels. Wow. Uh, surprisingly, there weren't uh, the knee-jerk uh, feminists or GLBTQ people who were zinging uh, um, Ramaswamy for that. So, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe they're leaning towards him. Maybe he's making sense to the people who used to be part of the woke incorporated complex, which, by the way, if you haven't figured it out, it's dead. Well, let's say it's moribund. It's dying. It's not dead yet. I think... Uh, Target or Target is still trying to push the agenda, you know, as um, dictated by whoever is behind the, the Target company. We know that retail is very much part of the uh, national security establishment, Target being one of them, right? Uh, but other, but you know, they're they're suffering uh, a loss in business because people are just not going to support it anymore. Just like they're uh, the P we the people are beginning to rebel against so called public education and their agenda which is anti-human when it comes down to it, right? Including anti-family and anti-gender. And you, you know the whole argument. It's beginning to fray. And so his message is going to resonate very strongly. At the same time, we have to be careful that he's not just telling us what we want to hear. Vivek Ramaswamy, right? Because we, we've we been primed for this other part of the dialectic, saying, okay, I'm going to throw this out. We'll see, right? We'll see. Now, mo many of you might not realize, but the person that he was criticizing at the debate is also South Asian. That's Nikki Haley. But she can avoid the Apu factor because she married an Anglo guy with an Anglo name, Haley Apu. 
is not a factor for her and she's a woman and you know i forgot her her um maiden name or she's she's sikh s-i-k-h i think she later uh converted to a christian denomination i'm not really sure on that so we see that i don't see any black hen as i can remember there but there's more women who are running for for the uh, Republican uh, nomination. So maybe the Apu factor is not going to be as big uh, as we might think, but I think it is a question that he didn't address here in Woken Car. And I know he can't address everything, but as his campaign advisor, if I was, and I'm not lobbying for the job again, I would say, how are you going to deal with the Apu factor? Because there is a large segment of the voting population, especially the older population, who don't think that uh, someone of his ethnicity, religio-ethnic background should be president of the United States of America because, um, you know, they remember the flower children of the 1960s and, and transcendental med meditation and Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and uh, the, the perfect guru of you know, all the different uh, characters, Bhagwan Sri, that come through there. He's got to, got to address that he's not one of the cult members that have been brought in through intelligence, Anglo-American intelligence, to gull the American people. Or maybe he is. I don't know. I don't know at this point. But he's got to address the Apu factor there, right? And by the way, to finish up the story with the Apu, um, the, the actor, uh, Hank uh, Azaria, uh, I think not too long ago, within a recent few years, said he was no longer going to do any of the voicing for uh, Apu in the series, right? I don't know if it's because of, uh, you know, his guilt or just wasn't politically correct anymore. He got tired or, you know, he's making money off residuals, I think, as part of his contract. But he's not. the point is he's not doing it. And the um, student who reached out to Matt Greening uh, protesting the portrayal of, quote unquote, her people. And Apu ran a convenience store, by the way, but he also had an advanced degree in mathematics. And Apu could be one of the people at MIT that the writers of The Simpsons or the Harvard uh, Mathematics Club who went to school with people like uh, who, who were blocked. They had advanced degrees, but they were not able to rise. They were able, but they had to um, be in uh, the motel business or uh, convenience stores, right? But anyway, Azaria is not going to do anymore. And now the people who are protesting Apu said, "Bring back Apu. We need him back. We we want. I'd, I'd like to see a feature film called the Apu story, right?" It certainly would be better than a uh, just a simple Simpsons reboot. Anyway, he was a good character. The writing was good. He was largely uh, sympathetic. And um, I think we might be over our uh, sensitivities there, right? Because Black Lives Matter and all that, you know, garbage that was corporate, corporate sponsored, corporate propaganda. I think most people have figured out. Colin Kaepernick didn't even know how to tie his own shoes, right? All these characters, they were they were actors. They were put up to it by Nike, whoever else, in order to get on um, the good side of um, of detractors of companies like a Nike, who runs, you know, Phil Knight, who supposedly found it. They don't have any manufacturing in the United States. It's all done by sweatshop labor, or near slave labor. Overseas, guess where? In Asia. <laughs> In the meantime, we're worshiping Michael Jordan, right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to end this in 60 minutes, but I do, I really, and you're going to hate me for this because a lot of people are off of it. They're, they're still protective of Trump, but they, 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 they think that Alex Jones has been compromised because, you know, the trial. And I think he still has a lot to say myself. And uh, full disclosure, again, I've been on his show a few times in, in the old days. I was the first academic. This is before the, the great Jordan Peterson scare. Um, you know, they brought him out of the shadows. I was on shows like this before any of those characters were there. And and the, the big one was... Um, 
uh, John B. Wells, where I introduced the, the, the notion of woke to the large segment of the American public, which is now a cliche, right? And I uh, was on the Alex Jones show for three, uh, three or four appearances. And uh, I think it was even, yeah, I was on a show with uh, uh, Owen Schroyer, who's now in, in jail and in prison, right? It's, it's a sacrifice. So anyway, the point is, is a lot of people soured on him, but I think still think he has some, you know, a lot to say. I did catch, because um, uh, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy has his own show, of course, and he interviewed Alex Jones against the advice of his own advisors. By the way, I'm a better advisor than, in, I mean, whoever wrote the, the line about Dick Cheney and Three Inch Heels, yeah, definitely keep that person. But the rest of them who are, who are advising Mr. Ramaswamy, do you take a conservative, safe approach? I think that's going to cause you to lose, and it's going to, it's going to uh, really um, undermine your own campaign. You, if anything... You should give free reign to your the, the edginess you're you're bringing to your campaign, right? This is what the testosterone testosterone deprived people who watch Joe Rogan, that's what they're looking for. That's what the testosterone deprived young men, the lads of Britain and the United States, that's what they're looking for when they when they tune into Russell Brand, all right? So you could be that candidate, and you will be unlike these other these clowns, you'll be able to deliver on your political program. Uh, not all of it, not not all in its entirety, in its totality, but again, I think you would have a good chance of narrowing the gap between the is and the ought. And again, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this does not constitute an endorsement of any candidate, including Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy, but I have only um, utmost respect for him, his family, his parents, and um, his, his accomplishment and uh, it gives should give everyone for me speaking for myself but it should give most of us uh an idea a better fix an idea of what american political culture truly is about it's not about black lives matter and la raza which has now taken out the raza and now calls itself unidos another corporate uh front organization or even um you know, the United Farm Workers were never, you know, come on. They're still hanging on there. And all these other ethno-specific groups, most of you have been co-opted by corporations. And Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy has has caught you out on that. So what are you going to do now? You're going to have to really deal with, with issues here. Anyway, this is kind of a long-winded uh, prelude to get those who are really Alex Jones haters. And I don't think you should hate on him. Um, I think he's he's a, a still a very very effective and valuable voice in uh, alternative media. I don't know if he's alternative anymore. He's pretty mainstream. But anyway, um, Mr. Ramaswamy had him on the show against the advice of his his uh, brain trust, and uh, they had a good conversation. And then Alex Jones reciprocated and had him call in. And uh, I want you to. This is an edited version of it, but I want you to, if you haven't seen it, I want you to gain some sort of um, insight into the person himself, Vivek Ramaswamy, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Alex Jones, who mercifully, <laughs> for the most part, keeps his mouth shut during the interview. So let's take a look before we return and sign off for today's vidcast, which for me has been a joy in preparing it. What would you do as president with the China situation? So I would sit across the table from Xi Jinping. We'd have a very different meeting than the one Biden had. I will tell him, you will not buy land in this country. You will not donate to universities in this country. U.S. companies will no longer expand or be allowed to expand into the Chinese market. We'll kick you out of the WTO and you will be held accountable financially using every financial lever we have available including our national debt, for unleashing hell on the world with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're not going to do business with China until China's playing by the same set of rules. No intellectual property theft, no data theft, no turning our companies into lobbying pawns. That's the hard answer. Wow. In the time we have left, I want you to be able to make any other key points you want. We're so honored to have you. 
look, they could assassinate Trump, God forbid, uh, whatever. I, I support Trump, and I think he's a good guy in many ways. I think, quite frankly, issue-wise, you're more informed than Trump. I'm just, I'm just being honest. I know he hears about the show. He watches. If he gets mad, that's great because we just want to encourage him to be even better. But I'm I'm really impressed overall, and I had good feelings about you, you know, a year ago, six months ago, read your book before you ran, one of your books before uh, you ran. But, but, but I want to throw a wild card at you. I like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I know they killed his dad in front of him, killed his uncle on TV in front of him. I want to think he's one of us. But when you look at his record of wanting carbon taxes and arrest people that question global warming and uh, and he wants AI to control everything, and uh, uh, he needs to either repudiate all that or say which Robert F. Kennedy Jr. he is. And I see him hurting Trump in the polls. If Trump dropped dead of a heart attack tomorrow, I, I'm still supporting you. You or Trump, I'd be happy with both of you. And I've, I've been honest, I'd say I'm, I'm happy with either one. You're you're the two best candidates. But if you were running third party, and I'm not saying do that because you're not on the ballot and you know it's not gonna happen, but I would I, I would have a real problem who I was going to vote for. It was Vivek Ramaswamy, third party, or you know Trump. We know Biden's propped up. It's a fraud. Be honest here. What do you think of Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? Because I respect your opinion. Yeah, so I think he is I, – I would like to think of it, Alex, as he's going through an evolution, right? We're all human beings, right? So I would like to give him some benefit of the doubt here, but I'm going to need hard proof from him that he has evolved his own position. We're human beings. We're allowed to change our mind, but him saying that if you're spreading climate disinformation, you should be put in jail, that's a concern for me. Him coming out in favor of racial reparations, that's a concern for me. And so my view is I give him a lot of credit for standing up to the orthodoxy of the Democratic Party, for otherwise standing for self-governance, standing against the weaponization of the financial system, and being against the war in Ukraine. I know from firsthand experiences, those are difficult positions to take, and I give him a lot of credit for that. That being said, before I would consider him in any role on a cabinet in my administration or even even involved in any way, I need to make sure that his values on issues relating to free speech and not bending the knee to the climate religion. And I would say that his allergic reaction to the Second Amendment, I would want to spend some time with him. And I think I could persuade him. Actually, Alex, I think he needs somebody who's actually sitting with him and actually debating him and persuading him. And then I think we can actually knock some sense into him on some of those other issues where he's been missing it. So I see a lot of potential there, but we're going to need to do some work in terms of, you know, I would say enlightening him on some issues where he might not actually Vivek, have that is a perfect, a perfect answer. I couldn't say it that well myself. That is exactly where I am. He needs to say who he is because yep. he needs to put out, he needs to put a platform. discovering who he is. I think he's still discovering who he is, is the truth, Alex. He needs to put a platform out. How yep. do people you find you? How do people problem. how do people get behind you? Uh, because obviously the establishment hates you like they hate Trump, which is a really you know the the gold star example. And we got three minutes left. You got to go. Uh, what else do you want to add to the viewers? What else do you want to add to the listeners? And then how do people well, get I'll behind your campaign? I think one thing is go to firerana dot com. I made that after the Republican debate. Just put your name down on the list. It's not asking for money or anything else. Just say you want to fire Ronna McDaniel. She deserves to be fired. So go to fireronna.com at your name. Next one, sign the No to Neocons pledge. Okay, I, I made that at no to neocons.com. Go there and say, you know what? The job of the U.S. policymakers is to look after the citizens of the United States of America, period. And then if you like this campaign, great. Join us as a volunteer. I'll take donations, grassroots donations, even if it's a dollar. We're sending a signal to the establishment. That's great. Vivek2024.com. That's the website as well. But I'll tell you this, Alex, we're just getting warmed up. I'd rather speak the truth at every step and lose some election than to win by playing some political snakes and ladders. You know, we're doing this because we want everyone in this country to know what's true and what's right. I'm going to tell you who I am and what I stand for. It's your job to come out and support us if that's the vision you want to see for this country. But America first, I'll tell you this, it doesn't belong to Vivek Ramaswamy. It doesn't belong to Donald Trump. It doesn't belong to Alex Jones. It belongs to all of you, the people of this country. And that's what we got to remember is this movement is bigger than any one of us. That's how we're going to drive change on the scale of history. I'm going to do my part and I'm going to expect that you guys do yours. Well, I totally agree with you. And, and again, it's not selfish to say America first or family first. If we don't stand up for ourselves and have our yep. own identity and our own jurisdiction, then we have nothing. So in two minutes that you got to go, 
You're on the debate stage, things you wish you would have said. I mean, literally, it was torture to watch all the other candidates. Nikki Haley, all of them, it was like nails on a chalkboard, and then you were just like a bright light in the middle of this darkness. In two minutes, what else would you have said, that, but they cut you off? Well, I would say some hard facts, right? So it's, it's no secret that I have a very different worldview than Nikki Haley, right? She's a globalist. I'm a nationalist. She believes in fighting foreign wars, and she's bloodthirsty. I believe we should stay out of World War III, and my moral obligation as the U.S. president is to U.S. citizens. But let's go through some hard facts. Just like I pointed out the Biden corruption, let's talk about how Nikki Haley left her time at the U.N. in debt, swimming in personal debt, and then starts a military contracting firm, and then makes secretive speeches to foreign actors getting paid sometimes seven-figure sal, seven-figure speaking gigs, and then joins the board of Boeing, whose back she's scratched for years as South Carolina governor, and then is now collecting corporate stock options while running for U.S. president. And now, just like Biden, is a multimillionaire. That is corrupt. It's corrupt whether a Democrat does it. It's corrupt whether a Republican does it. These people will send your kids to die so they can put more money into their own bank account. Republican or Democrat alike, it doesn't matter. That's what I meant when I said it's Dick Cheney and three-inch heels. That's not what we deserve as the American people. No one like that should get within spitting distance of the White House. Okay, I'm re-watching this again. And by the way, if you want to see the full uh, excerpt with Alex Jones, you can check out uh, the Patreon or just look at his channel. It's on band.video if you, if you like. This might be one of the few times here on this channel that you're going to see uh, this type of treatment of, of Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, an extended version. I might revisit it, his candidacy later, but in in this through this go around, watching it along with you, which is always fun, <laughs> kind of looking at the comments as well, um, as difficult as it is to read the legibility issue here. Um, I realize he's really sending out a message of peace. He doesn't come off as a peacenik, but he's saying, you know, no foreign entanglements. You know, we're not going to fight the wars of, of other uh, countries. And uh, the corruption is bound up with that. And I like that message. And I think that's a message that is going to have strong appeal to uh, young people in particular who are really interested in rebuilding the American economy. Um, and I think it's going to happen so one way or another. And again, it's not built on personalities. It's not contingent on personalities. It's built on, on these ideas that uh, Mr. Ramaswamy is keeping alive. And he's reminding us of our endowment as Americans, right? The thoughts, the philosophy, the emotion uh, content. And um, if, if there's one criticism, I'd say that there needs to be some sort of a, a addressing of the metaphysical and the religious, the spiritual component that always lies at the uh, center of any type of politics, right? It's politics of meaning of soul, if you will. And if I was to advise him, this is something that I would put in his next volume, right? There should be a capstone going into the election proper about his uh, what what he will do in order to to bring about the qualitative shift that's required in order to bring America back into prominence. We're not that far off the track, by the way. We're not as not not as much as the doomsayers and the gloom people who are, and they're most of them are supposedly on our side, but they're the ones that are that are talking, um, you know, apocalyptic language all the time and keeping us in a in a constant state. Of fear. Let's see what let's let's deal with the politics of hope and expectation, and then bring that to fruition through these ideas that we have seen in the past in our own history, our own national history, that we have seen work. Right? We've been there. We've done that. We've we have achieved success, and we can get back to that pinnacle. Uh, I'm, firm, I'm fairly, firmly a believer in, in that um, it's not a dream to me, it's a reality, <laughs> okay? So thank you, Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy, for this, and thank you for the people who were compiling all this really great information about him. He's had 
not much attention with the mainstream, the legacy, the corporate media, or the uh, independent media. And I'm hoping that the small channels like myself will remedy that or correct it and that he will uh, gain more um, attention, if not support, if you share this video with other people and continue this dialogue, this discussion. Okay, I don't know. I'm going to sign off here. Maybe I'll have the readings done for the Beatles next time. We'll have some fun with that. Always interesting and fascinating phenomenon, the Beatles. All right. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next week. God willing. Bye.